everyone this is the video for unit 6 on thermochemistry and really just it's about uh, energy and heat and how reactions produce or consume that there we go. so we're going to be looking specifically at how you have uh, energy involved in reactions and so we're going to start by defining what types of energy there really are um, potential energy kinetic energy chemical energy and we're going to just look at examples of those then we're going to look at what heat means versus temperature and then we're going to um, really just evaluate whether something is endothermic or exothermic and this is really the course level objective here um, is heat released and exiting the reaction or is heat going into the reaction? So we're going to start off by defining energy and then we're going to get into what it means to really mean to talk about heat versus uh, uh, temperature and then we're going to talk about endothermic versus exothermic processes. Now when we talk about energy, energy is just the ability to do something, to work or to supply uh, heat. And so if you think about in uh, food, for example, if you have food here, you eat the food, you eat the ham sandwich, actually it looks like turkey, um, and you then have the energy needed to move your muscles, to go through your day, to lift you know, your backpack or something like that. And so energy is either going to be the ability to do work or to heat something up. Um, so chemical energy is energy that is stored in those chemical compounds we've been talking about. And as those bonds get broken down, for example, from food, you get that energy that can be released and used for something else. Potential energy versus kinetic energy is a similar. Potential energy is the energy that um, you potentially have usually due to like position so for example this roller coaster perched at the top of a hill has a lot of potential energy it has the energy potentially to go to the bottom of the hill now uh, you could also have energy uh, potential energy of composition you know you, this food sitting on the plate technically has the potential to give you energy to get through the day Kinetic energy, on the other hand, um, I don't know if you guys know, kinesiology is the uh, study of, you know, motion and really getting into, like, exercise. Kinetic energy is due to motion. So something like uh, Newton's cradle right here. Um, there was a really cool one in, I think, the second Iron Man. It just continually goes with kinetic energy as being uh, used to move that. Now, technically, just like when we were balancing equations and we were like, you know, we can't really create or destroy matter, the atoms have to be the same on the reactant and product side, we also have conservation of energy. Energy isn't created or destroyed, you just convert it from one form to another. And so, in theory, the total energy of the universe is constant. So, you really don't gain energy by eating a sandwich, it's just that the chemical energy stored in the bonds of the food have been converted to energy for your body and so it's really a matter of energy just changes form so technically when we talk about energy we need to talk about units now this gets kind of less fun for a minute because it's just a lot of terms that we may or may not be familiar with and so as you look at uh, the unit of energy technically it is the Newton meter squared which translates to kilograms times meter squared divided by second squared we don't really use that I'm including it because it is the standard so just in case you ever decide to go into um, physics you will use that term a lot now typically we use two terms more one is the calorie now technically um, you are familiar with the term calorie from food labels well those calories are really kilocalories um, so they're really um, a thousand true calories now a calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius 
So when it says a candy bar has 260 calories, it really means 260,000 calories. Um, but that would probably not sell as many candy bars, so they use kilocalories there. Now, for the most part, calorie is used more in like food science. We typically use joule instead. So a joule is the amount of energy used when you have a, a force of one newton moving something one meter. And for our purposes, we're just going to use joules. It's the same as talking about grams or pounds. It's just a measurement of energy. Okay. Now, if we have to convert between the two, one calorie is 4.184 joules. I will give you this conversion. I'm not going to ask you to memorize it, okay? Now, as we talk about energy, there are two things that we need to consider. We need to consider, one, the, uh, the heat energy that's there and the work energy. So heat is really just a relative term it really talks about how fast an object is moving. The higher the, the temperature, the faster the objects are moving. And so as we talk about heat versus temperature, it is going to be really a relative term. Now, if you were to touch a hot pot on the stove, the pot doesn't say, oh, wow, you're cold. Instead, it is a heat is, it's a relative thing. And so generally we always think about heat going from the hotter object to the colder object. Um, think about this in terms of, you know, if you're outside, your hands get very cold, easiest way to warm them up is to put them on something warm, like your stomach or a friend's neck, you know, as mean as that may sound. And the idea is heat transfers from that hot object, the neck or the belly, to that cold object of your hands, okay? So in addition, we kind of also need to talk about work, which is force acting over a distance. Now the total energy is going to be the sum of both heat, which is either going to be Q or U. I don't know why they changed it. Um, and some people use Q, some people use U. I, I don't know. but whatever. Um, so it's either it's going to be the sum of the heat energy and the sum of your work energy. Now energy in general is a state function and what that means is we don't care how you got it, we don't care where it came from, we only care about the energy you have right now. I don't care if you ate a sandwich, you drank a cup of coffee, or you ate a candy bar, I don't know. Um, I don't care how you got the energy you have right now. I only care that you have the energy to watch the video, okay? Oops, there we go. So when we talk about energy, we also need to talk about whether energy is coming in or going out. Are we gaining energy or are we losing energy? And so for that, what we really want to do is consider the system's point of view. So if the system is, whether it's a reaction, a vessel, a room, whatever, um, it is what we specifically want to talk about. And the surroundings are everything else, okay? And so the idea is if the system gains energy, we consider that a positive. If it is losing energy, we consider it a negative. Now, for our purposes, and especially in our homework, guys, when we talk about energy, it must have both a number and the sign. So the quantitative number indicates the amount. The sign indicates whether the system is gaining or losing that amount of energy, OK? So in, uh, sorry, so work is really just, we talked about it a minute ago, it's, it's the ability to move or uh, perform something, lift something. So the system, for example, here is this little uh, vessel, the piston flask thing here. Um, and so if work is done on the system, meaning we're compressing it, we're really like pushing the system down, we're pushing the system into a specific part, 
work is positive. On the other hand, if work is being done by the system onto the surroundings, if it is being pushed against the surroundings, it is losing work because it is doing it for something else, okay? Now, we can kind of consider this um, until, uh, kind of like chores, okay? So if I come home and, you know, I think I've got a bunch of loads of clothes and dishes and things to do after work, and then the nanny managed to like fold a load of clothes she did that for me so i gained that work that work is done through no like problem of mine and so that would be a positive <laughs> yay i have less clothes um to fold <sighs> on the other hand um if i have to do extra work like for example I wasn't counting on it, but my children made a mess and I had to clean that up because they went to sleep without remembering to do it. That is negative. I had to go out and fix that myself. And so I lost that. So it would have been a negative value there. Oh, there we go. Now, in general, we calculate work as negative pressure times volume or times the change in volume. This delta right here just means change, which we can simplify as work is equal to negative pressure times the final volume minus the initial volume. It has to be negative, guys, because if you expand, you're pushing against the surroundings. You need a negative to really show that the system is losing that, okay? Um, if it is compressing, technically it would be negative, but you're gaining that work, so the negative times the negative makes a positive. So make sure you have the negative P delta V. Now, if we have to go between liter atmospheres for work, atmospheres, liters, and joules, which is the unit of energy, one liter atmosphere is equal to 101.3 joules. Okay, so let's find the energy in joules for the following. So here, um, a gas expands against a pressure of four atmospheres for from one liter to four liters. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and just, I wanna write it this way. Um, go away. Now we know that work is equal to negative P VF minus the initial volume, okay? Oh wait, that is not in the equation bar. Okay, now for our purposes, what we end up having is um, we have four atmospheres. Hmm, it's not going to let me do it. That's okay. We're going to insert a new one. Can you tell I'm struggling with um, things today? Our pressure is four atmospheres. And our volume goes from this to this. So this must be our final. So this is 4.0 liters minus 1.0, which we had initially. So if we multiply this, 4 minus 1 is 3. And in your calculator, if you could enter it just like this, but 3 times 4 is 12. But this negative right here gives us negative 12. Now, this is unit-wise liter atmospheres or atmospheres liters. It's just, um, we typically say liter atmospheres just because it seems to flow better. I don't know why um, else it would be. Now, in general, uh, we don't want this in liter atmospheres. We want to convert it to joules. Now, if we go back, every time we have one liter atmospheres, we have 101.3 joules. So we're going to go ahead and add this, insert, there it goes, 
every time we have one joule, we have 101.3, oops, I'm sorry, one liter atmosphere, we have 101.3 joules. Now if we look, liter atmospheres is going to cancel, so we're going to have 12, negative 12 times 101.3. You kind of end up with, um, really it's a more ugly number, um, you end up getting negative 1215.6. For our purposes, guys, I try to keep it relatively um, pretty. So you can usually round to two or three numbers. So for negative 1,200, negative 1,220, as long as you're in the ballpark, you should be okay. Okay. Now here, we have a similar situation. So let's go ahead and calculate this. Um, wrong square. Here we have the same equation. Work is equal to negative P times VF minus VI. Now here, for our purposes, we have a pressure of three atmospheres. Oops. Times. Now, um, I don't know why it's not working for me right now. Um, so we've got negative three atmospheres times, now this goes from five to two, to one liter. So it goes to one, so the final volume is that one liter minus the initial 5.0 liters. And so we have a situation here where negative three times a negative four gives us a positive 12 liter atmospheres. Units atmospheres times liters gives us that liter atmosphere. Now same thing though guys, here we've got a situation, we don't want liter atmospheres, we want it in joules. And so in order to do that we need to convert our units from liter atmospheres to joules. So we know from the last slide every time we have one liter atmospheres we have 101.3 joules. This is going to give us plus 1215.6 liter atmospheres cancels gives us joules. For our purposes we can round to about 1200, okay? So energy is the sum of both heat and work. This is how you find the work. Don't forget to go to joules or kilojoules if you need to. It's a matter of you can't use liter atmospheres. You want it to be in joules. Now, if energy is the sum of both heat and work, we know how to find work. We're going to use that equation and really just plug and chug away. Heat, on the other hand, is really a term that deals with the kinetic energy of the molecules. And for our purposes, it's all going to be rel relative to the system itself. And so, for example, is it going to let me? Yes. I have a video here. The idea is, oh, I've got to end. Hold on. Why can't you play the media? Okay, well that's okay because I can go to the website instead. And that, my friends, is why I have more than one way to do this. Control C. And I pause. Okay, so I've found the simulation. Um, now, the idea is it doesn't matter what we talk about, whether it's an atom or a molecule, it's all the same. 
Um, I'm going to keep it relatively simple for the moment. We've got a um, atom here, or a set of atoms here, and as we cool it down, there's going to be less motion. Okay, you can kind of see just like we talked about with states of matter, there's some vibration, not much else. Okay, and so if we heat it up a little bit, come on, there it goes. You see the, the molecules start speeding up, they start kind of navigating away from each other, they will continue to do that um, as much as you heat it up. And it's really actually proportional here. So the more you heat it up, the more they move, the faster they go. Now, if we were to cool it down again, the heat is leaving these molecules. They are going to slow down. They're going to stop bouncing quite as much. Um, hold on. There it goes. You can kind of see the temperature up at the top going down, and now we've reached a threshold. They're really starting to slow down a little bit. Okay. Now, if we were to use something else, now here we have um, what's it called? Uh, just an atom. It's nonpolar. It doesn't have many interactions, so it's really kind of going to happen quickly there. Um, on the other hand, if we were to do something like water, this is a polar molecule. If we were to cool this off, this started off at eh, frozen, but not really. It started off at like negative 20, like the freezer. Um, the more you cool it off, the less vibrations you have. On the other hand, as you heat it up, you can quickly see that the hotter it is, the faster those molecules move. They're spinning. They're bouncing everywhere. It just, um, it's going really crazy, which is fun to watch. Um, so this is about like steam and stuff. So. Anyway, uh, hotter the object, the faster they move. The colder the object, the less they move. Okay? Put this back to where it was. Um, so temperature is a quantitative measure. Uh, the higher the temperature, the faster they move. Okay? Come on. There it goes. Okay, now the other thing we need to talk about is heat in general. If heat is leaving a system, heat is exiting, this is going to have a negative value for the system. The system has lost it. It's the same as losing money. You have to write a negative value in your checkbook, okay? So the idea is whatever is lost from the system must go into the surroundings. On the other hand, if you have heat coming into the reaction, it is entering, it is going into the system, this heat is going to have a positive value. We call that endothermic. Sounds like into. And again, whatever the system gains has to be equal to what the surroundings put in. So consider the process of freezing water. Is it endothermic or exothermic? Now really guys, sit here and pause and think about this, please. At this point, I am going to assume you have paused it and really considered this. This um, freezing of water, you are going from a liquid to a solid. Liquids have molecules that move relatively quickly. Solids really just vibrate or stand still depending on your how cold it is. Now, that means you have gone from highly energetic molecules to ones that are mostly static. The temperature has gone from room temperature to the, or for water, uh, to the freezing temperature, which is zero. So you have gone down. You have lost that energy from the water. So believe it or not, this is actually an exothermic process. Now, why do we care? Now, a lot of this is very conceptual, okay? It's hard to comprehend why we would care about something like this. Well, there are several really good applications here. Uh, one of which is because this is an exothermic process, this is something that farmers will use almost every year, especially in places like Florida where you have a ton of citrus farms. Um, 
if they get a call for a freeze um, during the right before the crop you know is, is going to be collected um, what they will do is they will go out and they spray all the trees with water now as the temperature goes down over the night the water freezes the energy goes from that water into the fruit itself and that heat from the water freezing the exothermic water freezing allows the energy to leave the water and go into the fruit which here is the system I mean which here is the surroundings water is the system fruit is the surroundings um, and so that energy keeps the fruit from freezing even though it is surrounded by ice and so then the next morning when you know the temperature goes back up the fruit again is able to stay thawed and in, they usually are able to save the crop so the freezing of water is an exothermic process so consider each of these are they endothermic or exothermic ice melts in your hand please make sure you're pausing guys and just really consider this this is solid going to liquid you have the temperature going up so here it is going into that ice it is going into the system so this should be endothermic um, does it all at once yeah water boils on the stove so again water goes from liquid to forming that gas gas phase it's gaining temperature it's gaining heat so this is again an endothermic process uh, water condenses on uh, this the mirror after you take a shower here it goes from gas down to a liquid it goes from bouncing all around to kind of static on the mirror mostly um, and so here we've got it uh, the heat leaving the water the mirror always feels cool right so you have the hot steam going to cool liquid on the mirror and um, so this is an exothermic process to be honest um, I know you can't really tell because I, I even though I'm doing it you, you can't see um, but I will do interpretive dance with my hands as we do this ice melts solid to liquid it's heating it up it goes into um, liquid to gas it's heating it up the heat is going into um, and so I really say it this way almost every time so you know <sighs> okay so consider hydrogen gas oxygen gas they react violently um, to produce water which is lower in energy the hydrogen and oxygen gases or the water so go ahead and hit pause here consider this here because we know the hydrogen and oxygen have the potential to react they actually will almost explode together it's really interesting um, these have a really high potential energy um, they have a lot of energy stored in bonds they have a lot of energy just there water on the other hand thankfully is not explosive um, because you know our body is 60 percent water so it does not have the same potential to react violently so technically the water is uh, going to be lower in energy and I would say just because of how it reacted so here we're going to <coughs> calculate the um, internal energy and I just want to kind of give you guys some practice at dealing with this and so um, we're gonna look at each one of these I'm gonna go ahead and do the equation the same way uh, so let's go ahead and end this and I'll just hide the answers go away I'm going to now remember for our purposes energy is equal to the sum of the heat energy and the work energy okay so we need to find both the heat and the work and then we're going to add them together okay so let's just deal with the Q for a second Q we are told is 204.0 now calculate the internal energy in joules of a system that loses 204 joules 
and is compressed with a pressure of one atmosphere from three to one liter. Now, okay, so Q, it tells us it's 204.0, but be careful. You are responsible for the sign. Loses means that this is negative. The energy is leaving. So it's really negative 204.0. Oops, that's not a zero. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Oops, what just happened there? Now here, we also need to talk about our work. Work, we know, is negative P delta V. So it's going to be negative one atmosphere. And then our VF and VI. So our VF goes to one liter, so it's 1.0 liters minus the 3.0 liters. So in our calculator so far, we have negative one times negative two. Uh, you could really, you guys can enter this just the way it is. It might actually be easier um, to do that. I mean, negative one, parentheses, one minus three, you end up getting um, two, positive two, right? That's what I'm getting. So <laughs> I'm going to put my positive here because I want to make sure that I really don't mess this up. Now this is liter atmospheres. We need this to be in joules. We can't add joules in liter atmospheres, so we need to convert this to joules. So what we're going to do is convert using our units, oops, this one. We know that every time we have one liter atmosphere, we'll have 101.3 joules. This is going to give us 202.6. Oh, and I'm going to include my sign. Now remember guys, um, energy is Q plus W, so we are just going to add these together as is. E is equal to our negative, our heat is uh, negative 204.0 joules, and our work is positive 202.6. Oops. Adding these guys together, um, you should get something like negative 1.4. Okay? And so um, that's really how these work. Now, that you'll have some homework. You can redo the homework as many times as you want until you're confident with these numbers, but this is how it is going to look. So let's go ahead and do the same type of thing here. There we go. Okay, and then we can um, really evaluate all of this. Okay, so here we have got um, Q. So calculate the internal energy in joules, so it tells us our unit, of an endothermic system that absorbs 72.1 joules. So it's telling us our heat here. It's telling us it absorbs or that it's endothermic. Either way, it means it's going to be positive. So we know that this is 72.1 joules. Okay. Now, then it expands from 4 to 6 liters against a pressure of 0.25 atmospheres. So our work, we know, is equal to negative P delta V. Here, our pressure is 0 0.25 atmospheres. from this to this. So our VF is 6.0 minus 4.0 liters. This is going to give us, um, honestly I have to do it, negative 0 0.25 times 6 minus 4 in parentheses and you end up getting negative 0 0.5 liter atmospheres. 
Same thing though guys, we really don't want it in liter atmospheres, we want it in joules. And so to convert it, we're going to use that same conversion of um, one liter atmosphere is equal to 101.3 joules. And that is going to give us, oops, I don't know why that's doing that, negative 5 times 101.3, you get a uh, negative 50.6 or negative 50.7 I guess if you round joules. Okay. Um, if you want to you can round to a whole number. I really try as long as you have two or three numbers you should be okay. Um, you know we're not rounding from 50 to 100 we're just trying to keep it relative here. So here our energy is equal to Q plus W. So we know our Q is 70 plus 72.1. And we know our W is negative 50.7. Adding these guys together, 72.1 plus a negative 50.7. You end up getting 21.4 or, you know, negative uh, or positive 21. Either way, um, you're okay here. Okay. Now, the only other thing that we could do is to go from joules to kilojoules. And so just make sure you are clarifying whether you want joules or kilojoules in your system. Okay. Um, now, what I'm going to do is. We're going to make a new, new uh, thing here. OK, so for this part of the problem, we are specifying we want kilojoules. And so there's a couple ways you can do this. You can either solve for it in joules and then go to kilojoules, or you can solve for kilojoules and then add those two kilojoule components together. Either way is going to be fine. Personally, I kind of think it's easier just to get it over with, go to kilojoules, and then convert. I honestly have no idea what that was. I don't know if you guys could hear that alert on the computer, but wow. Anyway, okay, so here, calculate the internal energy of a system in kilojoules that loses 1.7 kilojoules while expanding from this to this against a pressure of 12 atmospheres. Okay loses 1.7 kilojoules. That tells us that that 1.7 should be negative. Oops, that's not a 7. And it's already in kilojoules, so we don't have to do any extra work here. Now here, uh, we've got to really plug in our problem. So we have work is equal to negative P delta V. So we have negative P which is going to be 12 atmospheres, times our VF, 4 to 6, so 6 is our final, minus the initial 4.0 liters. So in our calculator, negative 12 times 6 minus 4 gives us negative 24 liter atmospheres. We don't want liter atmospheres. We don't want that. We want to get to kilojoules. So what we really need to do is go to first joules and then kilojoules. We've been doing the liter atmospheres to joules. We know that one liter atmosphere is equal to 101.3 joules. We also know um, that we have to convert from joules to kilojoules. To cancel our units, we are going to put joules down here, and there are a thousand joules in one kilojoule. That was a, the slide a couple slides ago. I don't remember which one. Um, and so, if we check liter atmospheres cancels, joules cancels. This is as complicated as it will get. Okay, 
So here we've got negative 24 times 101.3 times 1 divided by 1 and then divided by 1,000. And technically the answers are over there, but I'm still checking my work because, you know, I make mistakes. This comes up to negative 2.43 2.4 kilojoules, okay? So our energy is Q plus W. So here we've got negative 1.7 for our Q and negative 2.4 kilojoules for our W. This is going to end up giving us really negative 4.1, okay? kilojoules. So here we've got a similar problem. Calculate the internal energy of a system in kilojoules that absorbs 2.16 kilojoules while being compressed from with one from one to three liters um, I'm sorry with a pressure of one atmosphere from three to one liters. Now we know that our uh, work is negative P delta V. I could probably do better with my pen, but my stylus is acting up, so we're just making it work. Um, okay, so looking at this, our Q absorbs 2.16. Absorb is a uh, word that indicates positive, so plus 2.16 kilojoules. Work is negative P delta V, so negative. Our pressure is 1.0 atms. Our VF is 1.0 liters minus the initial 3.0 liters. This gives us negative 1 times 1 minus 3 or a positive 2 point or 2.0 if you want liter atmospheres. We don't want liter atmospheres. We want to convert to joules and then technically because this says so we want it to kilojoules. So we're going to use those same conversions where we have one liter atmosphere is equal to 101.3 joules and then a thousand joules are in every kilojoule. So if we do that we have two times 101.3 times 1 and then we divide by things on the bottom so divided by 1 and then divided by a thousand you end up getting is that right yes yes it is you end up getting 0 0.2026 I'm again gonna round to two numbers here just two or three so I guess I could do two negative two uh, plus 203 um, kilojoules so for our, our E, E is Q plus W, so we have plus 2.16 kilojoules plus, here we've got a plus 0 0.203 kilojoules, which is going to be equal to plus 2.363, I'm going to round to three numbers, kilojoules. Now guys, the hardest part of this, once you get the two conversions, you're going to use the same two the whole time. To me, the absolute hardest part of this is coming up with your sign. It is so easy to forget to include a sign. So I really recommend when you are doing these calculations on your paper, please write down the signs, okay? Just so you know, hey, oh, I don't have a sign. Is it really positive? Let's go back and make sure. Um, include those signs when you are working these. Uh, now, I don't know if your homework needs those or not. Um, I'll try to make sure I specify, but just be aware of that, okay? That is where people mess up here. Come on. There it goes. Now, how do we measure heat? There's a couple of ways we can talk about heat in general. Um, if you've ever said, golly, I'm just so cold. Um, I just, I feel cold to the bone. You have dealt with, well, like, that 
indication of how much energy does it take to really warm you up, okay? And so we can kind of talk about that in terms of heat capacity. Now, heat capacity in general means uh, the quantity of heat when you have, that is absorbed or released when you have a temperature change, okay? Now its units are joule per degree Celsius. So the higher the, your specific heat or your heat capacity is, now it's either going to be a C or an S. It's the same thing. Why do they use Q or U? It should just be one letter. I don't know. It's C or S. For the longest time when I was in school, it was always C. A few publishers have started going to S. I, I, whatever. So anyway, um, the higher your heat capacity, the more energy it takes to change your temperature. Okay, now the lower that heat capacity is, the less energy it takes to change your temperature. Where does this matter? Well, honestly, this is why our planet is habitable. The heat capacity of metal. Think about it like if you put a pan on a burner, you know, it could even have a huge piece of metal in it, it doesn't matter. You put metal over fire and you go to touch it after a few moments, it's hot. It heated up really, really, really fast, okay? Nowhere in your common sense logic would you go to the oven to pull out a pan of brownies or a baking sheet with cupcakes or something and plan to do that with your bare hands. No, it's hot. It did not take much energy for that metal to heat up. It's got a very low heat capacity. On the other hand, water, you put that same amount of water, the same mass of water in the uh, oven or the stove, it takes a lot more energy, a lot longer time of putting that energy in to heat it up. That's good. Because what it means is we can walk outside in the desert or we can walk outside in, oops, um, other things. Hold on a second, we're going to pause. Okay, so that is um, averted. So now, guys, the idea is if you were to go up to a penny on a hot summer day and you went to pick it up, it's been on the sidewalk, it's really hot, you pick it, the sidewalk is really hot, it's hot outside, you know, whatever. You go to pick up the penny, the penny is going to feel really hot, like scalding. On the other hand, you pick up a bottle of water um, that's been sitting on that same sidewalk for a while, it's just going to feel kind of like warm, you know, no big deal. Same thing with sand. If you try to walk on the sand in the middle of the summer, on the beach, especially, you know, that really light colored sand, um, it can be brutal on your feet. On the other hand, the ocean temperature only fluctuates a little bit at, uh, during the, the whole year. So anyway, it just, that's how this works. Okay. Now, oops. I want this. There we go. Okay, so when we talk about specific heat capacity or heat capacity in general, heat capacity is just the amount of energy per degree Celsius. Specific heat capacity talks about the energy it takes to specifically take one gram of substance and raise it by one degree Celsius. So heat capacity is just in general specific heat capacity is specifically for one gram, okay? Now, as we look at <clears throat> the, really the last equation here, it's the heat energy is equal to the mass in grams times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature, and this is going to be final temperature minus initial temperature, okay? Now, what does that really mean for us? When we look at specific heat capacity, just like we were saying heat capacity, specific heat capacity, really the terms are almost interchangeable except for the gram component. Um, water has the highest by a lot. 
air is really low. I mean, it doesn't take much to heat up like the air above a pan or something. And then metals in general are very low as well. It doesn't take hardly any energy to heat up a metal. If we wanted to do a problem, and I know you guys don't have a lab, but technically this could be done. Um, an unknown sample is being evaluated in lab. What is the specific heat capacity of the compound if it requires 825 joules to raise the temperature of 75 grams from 10 degrees to 40 degrees? Now, I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I really like having my equations nice and written out, okay? So we saw on the last slide that Q is equal to MC, and then really we had delta T. I'm going to go ahead and write the final temperature minus the initial temperature, okay? Now, in general, what that really means for us is um, we can also talk about plugging in what we've got. Now, I typically like to make a plan, okay? So Q, M, C, T, F, and T, I, okay? Now, this is the heat in joules. Um, Q has just got, is just energy, and so we can go ahead and say, okay, well, 825 is given to us. Mass, is also given here at 75 grams, okay? Specific heat capacity is what we're looking for. We have no idea. The final temperature, it's raised from 10 to 40. So 40 is our final, and our initial temperature was 10. So we have everything we need to really plug this in, and it comes into um, really, Guys, it's up to you uh, how you decide to look at this. Um, what ends up... <laughs> Come on. What's, what ends up happening is it's really where you learn math how you want to plug this in. Do you want to plug it in first and then rearrange? Do you want to rearrange and then plug in? Either way is going to be fine. It really just depends on you. Um, I personally like to just kind of get it in there and simplify it. So I'm going to plug in everything I see and then I'm going to simplify and continue, okay? So my Q is 825. And that is, and that's a J, I don't know why the font is so weird. And that is equal to 75 grams times C, which we don't know, times our final temperature, which is 40, my, oops, minus our initial temperature, which is 10. And that is degrees Celsius. I don't know how to make a degree when I'm already in the equation thing, so I'm just going to leave it for a minute. Now, personally, I kind of want to simplify this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and multiply 40 minus 10 and then multiply by 75. And what that's really going to give me is, um, oh my goodness, 820, oops, 825 joules on one side is equal to 2250 and this is grams times degrees Celsius, and then that is multiplied by the specific heat capacity, okay? Now, um, oops, where's my equals? I really need a new stylus. So now at this point, we have both sides with a number and one variable, so to get this by itself, we're gonna divide both sides by 2250, and so we are going to, going to have um, 825 divided by divided by 2,250, and what it ends up being is joules divided by grams degrees Celsius, and so we're going to have the right units, which is a good thing, and you end up getting 0 0.366666 and so on joules per gram degrees Celsius is equal to our specific heat capacity. Okay. Um, so that's how this would work. 
Now, in all honesty, it can be kind of confusing. Like, how do you even know? The way that we measure heat capacity, the way we measure temperature changes, is through a, a kilometer. Usually what happens, like if you were to take 111, or if you go into nursing chemistry, I know you do this at some point, you end up having two coffee cups, and you put your sample in, you have a thermometer, you drop in an object, and you know that whatever the hot object um, and the, the hot object you, you, and the water are going to end up at the same temperature, so your final temperature is going to be the same. But the energy that leaves the hot object goes into the water, and so you can really kind of monitor, well, how much energy went into the water, how much energy must have left the, um, what's it called, the other object. Usually it's like pennies or something else that you would use. And so you can kind of look at the heat capacity of different objects. Now, in general, once again, why do we care about energy? Why do we care about these calculations? And it turns out, like, you know, if you want to really get into some of the industries that are popular right now, um, you have to know the best way to produce energy. You know, we look at what our energy use today is. Now, granted, this is technically five years old, but looking for a 2016 DOE annual review was exceptionally difficult so I'm using this one and it's really not that different um, from it changes by like 1% here and there so technically we use about 35% of our energy or 36% of our energy it comes from petroleum now of that almost all of it 70% is going into transportation um, we use 23% as industrial fuel um, maybe to power some kind of devices and in industry in general. Um, but generally, this is where the bulk of our petroleum use comes from. And interestingly, of all of our energy use, only 28% comes from transportation. So we can talk all we want about, you know, conserving gas by carpooling and stuff, but really, that is only 28% of what we use. Now, natural gas accounts for another 26% of our overall use. Um, here, again, about 30% goes to industry, 30% goes to residential. Um, re it's technically very efficient for like household heating, and so they prefer that as opposed to um, coal and a few other things. Um, it also has to do with petroleum and natural gas are both uh, easy to transport via pipes or uh, trucks whereas coal uh, is a little bit more difficult. It's a solid form. You can't just pump it here and there. You have to actually cart it in the back of a truck, okay? Um, and so it's relatively, you also get a huge bang for your buck from these two items, okay? Um, you can use other things, but they're not always as efficient in terms of you get as much as you can from it. OK, um, think of this in terms of like, you know, your favorite dessert might be a pudding. You might try and get every last little piece of goodness out of that pudding cup. OK, um, I've watched my child try to lick the bottom of the inside of those things. And it's just she's trying to get as much as she can. Same thing here. You get it so much efficiency here that it's a good choice. Coal is 20 percent of our uh, energy use. Um, we have, you know, coal technically gets a, a bad rap because you can sometimes get sulfur components there, which contributes to sulfur dioxide and sulfur uh, trioxide or acid, acid rain in the long, um, you know, in the long run. But technically, it is still an efficient use of energy. It is also, um, you know, usually it's homegrown. Uh, there's lots of coal miners in West Virginia, and it's a way to encourage that economy. So there's there's that. Now, 92% of coal, we don't really take, but maybe 1% to residences. It's much easier to cart it to one location, um, namely power plants, and use that to generate electric power. So you may think when you're turning on the lights that you know where your energy comes from, and that's not really true. A lot of it comes from natural gas, a lot comes from coal, 
and a lot comes from um, uh, nuclear power. And so you really have to research and educate yourself about where your energy comes from. When I was living in Texas in, oh golly, okay, I don't want to talk about it. 15 years ago, maybe we'll, we'll just, we'll just estimate there. Um, one of the things we could do is we could sign up for wind credits where we would purchase the local power station would purchase energy from wind turbines and use that. But what you were really doing is you were saying you were willing to pay an extra few cents per kilowatt hour for them to purchase it from a renewable source. And technically there was no way to guarantee you were using wind power, but you were saying, hey, when it's available, purchase this amount. And it was, you know, kind of an interesting dynamic they have. Um, in terms of renewable energy, we do have wind turbines. We do have a little bit of geothermal in this country, not much. We do use solar power some. And there's um, talk of smart roads where you have, you know, basically solar panels that are available in expanses. Um, in Texas and Arizona, a lot of open places where you have, you know, desert, you have solar farms. It's interesting, um, a lot of, well, I won't say a lot, uh, I've seen whole neighborhoods whose HOA is allowing for the, the rooftops to be solar panels. And so that feeds back into the system. Now, in terms of energy for nuclear power, nuclear energy gets a kind of a bad rap because, you know, it's not very efficient. I think you get something like eight or nine percent, whatever you you burn. So it's kind of like saying, hey, I'll spend money however, but you only get eight cents on the dollar back. Um, it's very hard to collect that energy. Um, if they were able to harness a hundred percent of it, uh, it would more than power all of our needs forever without we wouldn't need anything else. Um, a hundred percent of what we do use goes to power plants. Um, it doesn't go to, um, you know, homes. You don't, you don't, you know, wire it into a home or anything like that. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, in our country specifically, they typically don't tell you where a power plant is, you know, moving around with the military a lot. A lot of the times we've lived somewhere, and we may not have even known, but there's a power plant down the road like five miles. You know, it's usually off the road, hidden by lots of trees. You actually think it's a park or something like that, and you have no idea what is really there. And it's an interesting dynamic because what they really want is they don't want protesters or demonstrations, and um, so they just typically hide it. But really, we have 8% of our power coming from nuclear. Other countries have a much higher amount and it's just usually accepted a little bit better. And so you can kind of see from, you know, 1950 to almost now, um, really our petroleum use in uh, general has started to decline. Natural gas is going up, coal is declining. We're really using a lot more renewable energy overall than we have in the past. Now, in general, again, they always tell you, oh, turn off your lights, you know, at home. Our overall energy use at home is about 22% of the overall countries. It's really more uh, industry and transportation are the two big areas where you can save on energy. But it's just, uh, you know, one of the ways we can make a small difference. Now, there are lots of advances right now, and I'm not going to get into all of them, but I will tell you, like, the big ones are windmills and solar fields, solar panels in general. Um, windmills, the, the good thing about windmills is once you put them up, you know, they start collecting as soon as there's, you know, a breeze. Um, and there are areas, you know, that have lots of wind. And so that works. The problem with windmills is they are kind of hard to maintain. And a lot of people consider them an eyesore. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of energy to actually build a windmill. You know, you have to get the steel, you have to construct it, you have to do everything. And there's a lot of debate now of, is it worth it? The amount of energy that you put into a windmill, are you going to get that energy back, the equivalent back over the course of that windmill's lifetime before you have to replace it? And, you know, it's, you know, it, it, it's a debate. 
So um, solar panels, same thing. They are becoming more and more efficient all the time. I have seen them on tops of cars. I have seen um, roof tiles that are now solar panels um, so that they actually look like a roof tile, but they're really a solar panel. Um, it, smart road, solar fields. There's a lot of areas, especially, you know, in, you know, like Arizona that they can get a lot of power from that, especially if you have batteries and uh, packs of batteries. I forget what the big ones are called off at the moment, but if you store enough energy, you can have enough energy for days based off, you know, solar panels. And, um, it's, it's an interesting dynamic here because, um, you know, <laughs> If you have enough renewable energy, you can sometimes get a paycheck from your power company, um, but the initial startup cost is kind of high still. Now, we are one of the few countries that are, you know, we've already got people that want to live off the grid. They don't want to have to buy electricity. They don't want to have to pay for, you know, utilities the way that people have been doing for so long. And it's interesting because Germany... I think it's been two or three years ago now, said they are no longer going to build any uh, power plants. They don't want to do it. They don't have the land for it. They're not going to do it. So the way that they're getting around this is they have said that all new homes must be completely self-sufficient in terms of energy, whether they have solar panels or a wind turbine attached or geothermal pumps they do not want to have to take out more energy than they put in in the grand scheme of things and um, usually when a company uh, I'm sorry when a country does something like that it's usually followed very soon afterwards by other places and you see the trend here I think it's going to start being a bigger trend because I mean who doesn't want to save money every month you know so um, there's a big push in general to go to this carbon neutrality which means you have a net zero of carbon emissions. So whatever you produce in terms of waste or uh, your carbon footprint, you're also putting, um, you're also contributing to the good side of it. Okay. Now the Vatican City was the first. I don't think it counts as a country. What is what is? Uh, okay, they were the first place um, to be declared completely carbon neutral. It was, happened in 2013 and the way that they uh, achieved it is they <laughs> hired a company to plant a forest and um, the idea was the forest would consume a lot of CO2, put out oxygen, and the other way was by using solar panels. So they're given this credit for being carbon neutral. Um, Interestingly, the company that they hired to build the forest went out of business, so the forest is still in queue. At some point, it'll be built, I guess. Costa Rica aims to be carbon neutral by 2021. They already use 47% renewable energy um, with 94% of their electric generated by hydroelectric power. But you think, Costa Rica, waterfalls, that's what they have. You know, they use what they've got. They also use wind farms and geothermal energy. Denmark's Samso Island is supposed to be the largest neutral carbon neutral settlement on Earth. Um, they use a lot of wind power and they use biomass heating. And then they also generate and export their electricity to account for any like vehicles that they use that use uh, gas. Then there's a bunch of other countries that are doing the same movement because they want to achieve um, that that status and in fact I think Sweden um, they burn a lot of their trash and then I uh, they take that energy and use it to convert to electricity so there's a big push for this it's just really interesting um, field to study at the moment with lots of news articles all the time so this was the video for unit six yay Please tell me it's there. Uh, 
Jesus, please. 